Hello and welcome to Poverty Mythbusters Changing Lives. Thank you for joining us today. Before we get the conversation started, I first wanted to let you know that the, this presentation is being recorded. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land on which YSM serves. We acknowledge the land on which YSM serves the people of Toronto is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. While we would love to have hosted today's event live, we are still in the age of COVID, so this Zoom setting will have to do. That said, as with any online event, technical issues may arise. So we do apologize in advance for any glitches that may occur. We have a team in the background monitoring the event to ensure we address any issue quickly. So please bear with us if that should happen. So we will be taking questions at the end of the formal presentation today. If you have any questions as you listen to the panelists, you can type them into the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen. While we may not get to every question live, we'll be sharing every question and answer in an email after today's event. So without further ado, and we're anxious to get the conversation started, I am pleased to introduce your panelists today. And that's on our next slide. Um, Sandra Seaborn, Esther Jang, and Jeff Abraham. These are YSM staff members who are here to share more about how YSM is changing lives for members of our community. I'm so happy to welcome Sandra Seaborn to the screen. She is YSM's Senior Director of Programs for YSM. Over to you, Sandra. Well, hello, and again, a welcome to our second webinar in the Poverty Mythbuster series. I am so glad that you could join us. As I was introduced, uh, you know that my name is Sandra Seaborn, and my role here as Senior Director of Programs at YSM I oversee the work that we are doing here in Toronto day in and day out with street involved youth, families in crisis and adults experiencing chronic poverty. And over the next 45 minutes, Esther, Jeff and I are going to intersperse conversation and videos as we explore this theme of changing lives. Now in the first video, that webinar, we, we started myth busting process by exploring reasons that someone might find themselves in poverty to begin with. We learned of a family who due to circumstances beyond their control, found themselves in crisis, a financial and relational crisis that led them to a loss of stable housing. And we will have a highlight reel in a moment of that previous conversation to share with you. And you're gonna hear again briefly, the realities facing low income families and individuals in our city. You're gonna hear about how our social service system, which was designed to support people through times of crisis is no longer working to get people out of poverty. Designed after the second world war, that social security net is outdated and no longer reflected of the realities that we face today. Our stretched shelter system also pulls families apart at a time when their unity matters the most. And I think as all of us feel with inflation, increasing food costs, along with things like precarious employment, unaffordable housing prices continues to make life a daily struggle for survival. So to recap that story, let's start by watching the highlight reel from the first webinar to bring us all up to speed. To begin, I'd like to give you a little bit of a backdrop. Our system, at least what we're doing today, it's outdated. It's not addressing the poverty issues of today. I'm gonna to tell a story about a family of four. Mom has lost her job during COVID. Dad's pain in his feet uh, gets super bad and he can't make it to work. He misses some shifts and he is promptly fired. And very quickly, they're having to choose between do we get groceries or do we pay rent? A children Aid Society worker arrives and finds out that this family does have an eviction date. They will be homeless um, very soon. They find out that they, there are no available spots in family shelters. And so it's recommended that they go to different shelters. Um, Dad is given a spot in a men's shelter on one end of the city 
and mom is given a shelter in another end of the city uh, with the children. And the Children's Day Society worker looks at this family, assesses the family's needs, and you know realizes this is a family that is struggling uh, because of poverty and not necessarily because there's child safety concerns. And because of that unique partnership we have, they're like, you know what? We trust YSM to come in and support this family with their needs while maintaining um, the well-being of the children in the home. And so we want to inspire hope when we meet with them. We want to present the possibility of things getting better, but also showing them the strength that they still have. Um, you know, sometimes when you're in the thick of things, you do not realize how strong you are. You do not realize what re resources you have within yourself or within that family unit. Our work believes in family, healthy families being a foundation for healthy communities. And life events happen to all of us. We just happen to have a lot more resources to help us get through them. Community actually plays a pivotal role in creating the kind of city we want to have. Wow, well, if you haven't seen the whole first episode yet, I do encourage you to watch the whole thing. And what I hope you're gonna hear in that video um, is not only how someone might found themselves in poverty, but some of the good work that's happening right now to mitigate those very challenges. And you, you heard a little bit there how we highlighted that unique partnership that YSM does have with Children's Aid Toronto. And that's a partnership where we um, help parents uh, keep their children as they have a plan to change their situation um, in when there's a, a risk situation with their children. Overall, our goal at YSM, of course, is to inspire hope and strengthen resiliency and so that we can change the stories and change lives. Now, Today, because we're moving through a series of these poverty myth busting, uh, we're gonna explore three particular myths today. And they're connected to questions that we often hear about when we talk about changing lives. So at one end, what we hear sometimes is, why can't people just get a job? There's lots of jobs out there, why can't they get a job? And at the other end of a spectrum, another question that we often hear is, is it even possible to get out of poverty at all? And then finally, we're going to personalize the issue, and that is how can I help? So to get into these more specifics, I'm going to invite Esther now onto the screen to share with me. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here. And uh, Sandra, thank you for the warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, being with us today, Esther. You work as part of our employment services team and you coordinate one of our six employment programs. Um, before we get into the details of your everyday work, can you tell me what do you look forward to when you do come to work? Mm, so YSM really centralizes on building relationships. So I look forward to catching up with our community members and seeing the dynamic between them and our staff. We're pretty much like family. And since I personally value unity and collaboration so much, um, I feel so fulfilled and thankful to be working in a space where I can see everyone working together, especially with the focus of supporting our community members. Those are really generous words, especially since I know that you started during COVID. Um, so it's quite a testimony that we can even be collaborating during those this time. Um, Tell us a little bit more, what does the program that you coordinate do to help people find work? We help anyone from ages 18 to 60 to find work. Our program specifically focus on, focuses on supporting people with mental health challenges or learning disabilities. And we provide training and support on interview skills, uh, building resumes, um, professional attire, um, and conflict resolution, and many more. We also support them with any work items or transportation fees. Um, that are needed for their jobs. We have a wraparound care approach for our community members, which pretty much means that we are participant focused and all staff collaborate together to support their needs. Um, we would meet the participants once a week, sit down and talk, get to know them, um, get to know their, their strengths, their interests, and also go through an employment readiness rubric and set some goals before finding work. You've given us a lot of a lot of details there about kind of the day-to-day -day that might happen when somebody comes and looks for work. 
Why is it in your experience in talking with the people that you've been supporting through these, uh, especially through this COVID time, why can't they just apply for a job on their own? Like, why is it that they need YSM support at all? For many of our community members, they carry a lot of trauma, which affects their mental health and ultimately their life. Um, what seems like a basic task actually takes a huge toll on the individual. There's a lot of anxiety, fear, and doubt that comes from deep-rooted hurt. So one example is one of our staff introduced a youth to me and she had major anxiety. Uh, she had been in another employment program to help her build her resume, but because of her anxiety, she wasn't able to hand out her resumes in person, especially during COVID. And so when she joined our program, I realized that she had a solid resume. Her skills were actually quite advanced, but it was her mental health challenges that needed support. So it sounds like you're working with people who face multiple barriers to success, and maybe they've even tried on their own before coming to YSM. If, if that's the case, how do you engage or, or motivate those the people you're working with on their journey to change? Because it sounds like it's not going to be kind of a always smooth sailing. Yeah, so the first step is always to sit down and talk with them and really get to know them and build that relationship. And by then we can respond to their different needs, whether it be mental health, employment, housing, um, food, and we can invite and support them with the various services we have here at YSM. But it really is through the report with the individual that can start the change. Uh, we learn more about them, get to know their strengths, like as I mentioned, and how to, how to motivate and journey with them. And so we can, through these relationships, we can build them we can guide them, sorry, we can guide them with important life skills and help build community because many of them don't feel safe in their current ones. And so when that trust is there, you can also challenge them out of their comfort zone and it won't come off as threatening or offensive because they know it's set out of love and care. Wow, so you're listening first, you're looking for the needs and responding to their immediate needs and then you're inviting them into really all kinds of conversation, relationship, and maybe even a new set of um, not just relationship with you, but relationship with others so that they can be supported in whatever their new stage of life is. Have you, have you found in your work that there is one method that works the best or one tool that works the best when you're trying to support people in kind of meeting the goals that they've set for themselves? Yeah, the wraparound care approach is definitely, I would say, the best that we use in our employment program um, because there are various factors that can hinder stable employment. Um, and so, you know, for example, there could be um, pending legal issues. So we would find, um, find out, okay, what are some barriers that we can tackle on together? And we collaborate with other staff who specializes in that area and, um, and eliminate those barriers and we can support them the best that way. Um, one tool that we do use um, across YSM is called the Times Tool, uh, which has 18 indicators and on a five point scale that we developed in house. It lets us see progress towards wellness and wholeness across uh, beyond economic stability and employment readiness, um, which includes areas such as relationships, sense of power, self-awareness and shelter safety. That's such a beautiful segue because you've kind of given us a glimpse of how we start to work with people um, and how it is actually possible to uh, move out of poverty, to find a job also being one of the maybe key tools of that, but not being the only piece, right, that needs to happen if someone's going to have a changed life. A job is one component. Let's take a few minutes now and look at one of the videos that we've prepared that kind of gives an overarching picture of all the different ways that YSM does. So we'll see just a little bit even more than just employment services. YSM operates over 100 programs and services designed to move people from surviving to thriving. When a community member walks through our doors, they are welcomed into an environment that sees them as a person with value and purpose. Our approach is to believe in people until they believe in themselves. This is the foundation of how YSM changes lives. When someone is in crisis or experiencing oppression, their image of themselves is distorted and damaged. 
We help people cut through the clutter in their minds and see themselves as we do. We help people restore their lives so that they can experience hope. On the journey of transformation, we start by responding to where a person finds themselves, to the most pressing barrier they face. That means we often start by meeting immediate needs, such as food, clothing, counseling, and health care. These low barrier services are offered to youth, families, and adults experiencing poverty through our drop-ins, group, and individual appointments. Once stabilized, we then invite participants into more targeted programs that teach life skills, explore vocation, build employment readiness, and practice budgeting. The power of our invitational program is the trust that begins to form between community members and the YSM staff and volunteers. With trust established, we work with people to create action-based goal setting. This goal setting visualizes what life can be and we see people begin to believe in themselves. Goal setting goes hand in hand with YSM's wraparound care, which provides step-by-step -step supports along the way. This journey towards stability is what YSM calls the RISE model of care. It's an acronym that stands for Respond, Invite, Support and Engage. We respond to immediate felt needs, invite into holistic programs and support our community members in a plan they create for themselves. Last but certainly not least in transforming lives is the step of engage, where participants start giving back by serving within their new spheres of influence, starting the process of building their new community. Some volunteer with us, some find civic opportunities, still others help neighbors going through their own challenges. YSM's RISE model, Respond, Invite, Support and Engage, is designed to help people experiencing poverty to believe in themselves, producing a uniquely tailored combination of relationally based programs and services to each individual. The end result is changed lives. Wow, well, a lot was certainly covered in those two minutes. Um, Esther, um, I think I even saw you at the beginning of that video. Was that you that was there kind of in the beginning coming in to Evergreen site? Yes, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fun. Um, I'd like to understand a little bit more about that second part of the RISE model, the support and engage part. Can you tell me a bit of a story of how this approach, the RISE approach might look like as we're helping someone to find work? When we, when we sit down and talk with the community member and we first started out by getting to know them and their strengths and what, what do they need help with? What do they need support in? Um, then we're able to um, just identify, right? We need to respond to their needs that invite and support them to the different services that we have with the different staff as well. And we would go through, um, you know, set some goals. We meet once a week. Um, we can go through uh, employment readiness rubrics. What are the different areas? And it's very similar to times, actually. Um, you know, how do your relationships look like? How do you want to build your community? Um, you know, how is your attendance like in these different programs? We, we see the different changes and the growth that is needed on a weekly basis. And none of it is ever li linear. Um, but, you know, that's why they have a huge safety net with our community and we're able to support them best that way. So can you tell me the story of someone who, through those supports, um, you've seen a change in their life? Oh, there are many. Um, <laughs> so there is... Well, that's good. That's good. <laughs> um, there is one, one individual... Um, you know, she came to our program and she was a referral uh, from Bridges or Cornerstone, um, one of them. And so she was ready to, uh, to start work. And so when we had done that intake with her, um, you know, she, she hit all the um, eligibility criteria for our program. But we found out quickly um, during the work placements that 
Uh, she had several pending issues. Uh, she was not taking her medication for mental health. Um, you know, there were some interpersonal uh, difficulties there with her relationships. These, all these different um, tensions that were coming together. Different and barriers, right? Different barriers that she's facing um, yes. and maybe why she's getting help from us in the first place. Yeah, exactly. And so before we paused, we actually paused the work placement okay. and we decided to, you know, how can we support them in their legal, le legal issues and all the court cases that she has. Let's get her back connected to our um, psychiatrist and get, um, uh, get her acquainted with the medication again, all these different things. And so when that was, when those barriers were removed, um, that's when it, she's actually, she actually came back to the work placement and now she's employed. So, Yeah. It's been good. That wrapped up really quick. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, how do you know, like, do you, like, what does success look like in terms of um, long term? Like, do you just count it because she got a job or is there more to success in when you're, when you're thinking about uh, checking if what you've done is actually being effective? Uh, there are two ways. So um, <clears throat> one way is, um, it's usually a really great indicator if they frequently come less and come less to YSM and user services yeah, yeah. Uh, because it means they've moved forward and uh, they just don't need our services as much anymore. Time to time, they'll come for lunch uh, to grab food. They'll have some medical appointments like visiting our health center. Um, but for the most part, yeah, it's a good sign. Um, as I mentioned before on times as well, um, we're, we do a quarterly report on our system and we're able to track, okay, in these areas, they have grown so much and they're so stabilized. And then maybe in the next couple months, oh, we see that in one category, um, they, they need a little bit more growth here. So it's never linear, but um, mm -hmm. you still see uh, the level of change and growth over time. Right. I, I mean, I love to hear how that all comes together that actually using our services less is an indicator of success and that we're looking for success that isn't just like one small part of someone's life, but actually thinking about them really holistically, their wellness, their health, their nutrition even I'm, is on there, right? The sense of power, their values, all of that is what helps the changes stick. And I think just in talking to you, it feels like we've sort of busted that myth of like change isn't possible. Like that once you're poor, you're stuck because with that wraparound support that you've talked about, the, the case of the person you're describing is that change has happened, right? And that they're not stuck anymore um, and that they've been able to uh, take those steps that they wanted to take in their life towards a new beginning. Thank you so much, Esther. I really appreciate that. We're going we're gonna to move over, though, now to think about the last of those myths that we addressed, and that is the myth of how can we help. If, uh, if you're not a, a staff person of YSM, is there anything you can do to alleviate poverty? Well, yes, of course there is, um, but what it is is that, see, social service agencies like YSM is one of it are we provide these supports for change and we provide professional relationships and these are important relationships as you heard Esther describe the supports we provide equip people with the life skills um, but we also know that the uh, participants, the people we work with really need to find community um, in order to in the long term navigate their contexts independently. And that is where our volunteer services come in. So I'm going to turn now and invite Jeff to the screen. Uh, Jeff, welcome. Hey, Sandra. Thanks so much. Uh, excited to be here. And you've been listening to this conversation so far. How does volunteerism um, intersect with this RISE model of uh, life change? Yeah, we uh, thanks so much. We uh, heard Esther talk a little bit about this, and the E in RISE is really important, which is the engage part. This really is an opportunity to involve community members uh, who have really found their footing and strength to be able to pour into the life of somebody else who maybe is not as far along in their own journey. Uh, this act of giving back really is coming from their own lived experiences and can be therapeutic for themselves and helps other people as part of the process. You know, Esther talked about uh, job readiness. There's an aspect here as well to celebrate community members who have become volunteer ready as well. Uh, there's power in this and we see it come to life all the time here at YSM. 
I love that term, volunteer readiness. Um, so what kind of activities, if I were volunteer ready, could I do to help support other people's lives also change? Yeah, uh, we definitely have lots of opportunities for people to get involved. Uh, so volunteers uh, change lives by, you know, lending a listening ear, greeting people at our programs, uh, ensuring they get the food that they need, the nutritional food they need at our programs, um, ensuring that services are available to all who need them. Uh, we have volunteers who support our employment services or even help uh, community members get ready with their taxes. Uh, community members have uh, some knowledge and they know that somebody is there to care for them. Yeah, I need help with my taxes too, but I do know our, <laughs> our community members, it's so critical, right? Because uh, without having completed your taxes, there's certain programs and government uh, services that you just cannot access. So it's a critical component of someone uh, being able to move in that journey from surviving to thriving out of poverty. Exactly. Yeah. Now, I understand you've prepared a video for us um, where we're going to hear from some staff and volunteers about the impact that volunteering has had on them. Uh, can you tell us uh, what we're about to see? Yeah. Uh, so this is an opportunity just to see some of our volunteers uh, in the settings that they're doing the work uh, and to help uh, the community. So just get a glimpse of the different types of volunteer services that we have here and wanted to give a chance for everybody watching to see how they can get engaged and see maybe from their perspective how they could fit in. Uh, also included in this clip is a staff who's going to be talking about one of our volunteers uh, who is a community member uh, who has gone through that journey of moving uh, into the E of Engage through the RISE model. Great. I'm looking forward to it. Some of our community members happen to be our volunteers, especially at Church at the Mission. They find belonging and purpose in the volunteering that they do with our programs and at the Mission. I think the volunteering at YSM has given me way more than, than I've given them. It's just a, a blessing in my life. I like volunteering over here because people come in to do, to do their day-to-day -day shopping of the grocery things, so it helps them in their requirements in the home. My experience has been tremendous. I've done this for a number of years. Obviously, last uh, year with the pandemic, I wasn't able to volunteer here, but being a part of YSM and the community and giving back to the community is something I felt strongly about. I love watching how the staff interacts with one another. I think what impacted positively in me by participating in this program was first to see the resiliency in my mentee and how good was at embracing challenges and embracing new opportunities. So I come here to give it back to the community and coming here and seeing people come here and smile and take things and be happy with it has really given me a positive attitude because it helps with the community. It's really important to volunteer as a team because it brings together camaraderie. I think as an organization, we like to give back as a group, right? So it is about individuals, but also what are we doing collectively as a group to help the communities that we live in and the communities that we also play and work in as well. I think it also made a nice impact in realizing that through unprecedented and challenging times, there will be people that will support each other and that I was there for someone but that someone was there for someone else. So while I don't get to really interact with people, I get to hear about all of the amazing things that are happening because of the back office and being here and seeing all of, and listening to people who are donating. Resiliency theory says that for people to be able to you know, have some resilience in their life and be able to move forward past difficult backgrounds. They need uh, one or two people or three people in their lives who believe in them. And so any of us who can be that along the way, I think it's a gift to them and can give them a push in the right direction. Well, that is quite a range of examples and voices in that video, uh, Jeff. I was particularly struck by the uh, young woman who said, you know, I was there for someone and then someone could be there for someone else and how that tied 
in with what the health center volunteer said about the resiliency theory of um, having someone believe in you. And I'm wondering, can you unpack for us a little bit, what does the mentee, like that young woman mentioned uh, that she was a mentee or a mentor. Can you tell me a little bit what that is? Yeah, so our mentors are, we have a student awards program here at YSM, and uh, it's an opportunity in the first year of their program that they get paired with a mentor. Uh, and in that opportunity, we have other mentor opportunities I want to mention, like family to family, we have a man to man, uh, and a few other programs. So what this really offers is that lending ear for somebody to listen and hear uh, without judgment. Uh, and so they're there to support um, the, the uh, mentee uh, in their journey to kind of navigate some of those new spaces and challenges that they might have in post-secondary education specifically. So you can be a mentor as a youth, you can be a mentor if you're a family, your age isn't the, the issue there because we have that across various different um, parts of our organization. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, that's right. So don't let anything be a barrier to you. Uh, we, we want to engage with anybody and uh, who wants to be able to support uh, community members in this way. So I'm, I'm curious, because we have this wide range of different ways people can help, is there any kind of baseline of experience or skills that's kind of mandatory for everyone who wants to help? So uh, not necessarily. Uh, we just need people who are willing to give their time. That would be the baseline, I would say. Right. Uh, and uh, in terms of other things, though, so for instance, we had the health center volunteer. So if you wanted to be a dental volunteer, you do have to be a dentist. We can't that's just good. That's good. Yeah. yeah. That's and good I'm reason. assuming like tax volunteers are accountants or have some training there too, right? Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but in all the other roles, uh, as long as you have the willingness to learn, uh, we want you to be here and to support the roles that we have available. Um, we will do the training with you uh, and we want you to be involved in the ways that make sense for you. And, and for all of YSM's 125 year history, uh, my understanding that we have relied on the partnerships with volunteers to build relationships and community towards the goal of changing lives. But since we did just celebrate our 125th, I know that we launched something new for the celebration of our 125th related to volunteering, maybe even more broadly to how people can help here in Toronto. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, it was uh, very exciting that we've been around for 125, now 126 years. So last year, uh, in our 125th year, we started uh, something called the Gift Six campaign. Uh, we live in the Six, uh, Toronto, as it's colloquially known as. Uh, we wanted to inspire people to do what they can, where they can, to make a difference in our own city. Uh, so celebrating our 125th year by giving back to our community, um, there were six ways we had people to get involved, whether that's donating, volunteering, inviting community members, learning, like everybody's doing here today on the webinar, this can be one of your give six actions that you put in, uh, and then advocating and sharing with uh, six other people about what you can do to inspire others. That's a great overview. Can you give me some more practical or granular examples of what that might look like, let's say for the advocacy one or, or practically helping someone. If they if someone isn't able to volunteer, what are what are some of the other things that are on that um, Give6 program? Yeah, so with Give6, it's really an opportunity for you to think of uh, what six things you can do in your sphere and make a difference where you are. So we had uh, a few people who bought six items and donated it to the food bank, for instance. Uh, and advocating, it's uh, finding out and talking to your local MPs or your local politicians to talk about something that's important and of value to you. Um, and also, you know, reviewing six resumes, looking through six resumes and helping people to be able to maybe refine those uh, skills on the resume to help them find uh, better opportunities for them. Uh, so again, we wanted this to be something that people can find something that works with them in their schedule and six things, any six things to make a difference in our community. Um, so we were very excited uh, because one of the things we did was we partnered with uh, another organization, Volunteer Toronto, uh, and they kind of really shared opportunities to volunteer, not just at YSM, but in other organizations across the city. So uh, that was really, really exciting to see that move forward. 
we're sort of like taking your sphere of influence and thinking about six different things or one thing six times that you could do that could improve the life of your neighbor, help someone else's life change. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Um, but if people uh, are watching today who might want to actually volunteer directly with us, um, what are some of the specific roles or skill sets that we're looking for at the moment? And maybe unpack a little bit also how they could get involved or where they would look to find out more. Yeah, so um, I think at some point there'll be a website that will show up or a QR code for uh, uh, our volunteer, so ysm.ca slash volunteer, that's the simplest way to see what we have available. Uh, but we have so many different opportunities uh, for people to get involved. And this is the whole E&N in, in the RISE model, right, to be engaged here. Um, and so this is an opportunity, whether you want to, we're coming up to our, our new batch of student awards recipients who are, uh, so we're going to be looking for more mentors uh, specifically. Um, and so we're also looking for regularly uh, at our food bank, at our Evergreen Kitchen to see volunteers come there and help more. Uh, and then if you're thinking about the long-term commitments, yeah, the mentoring opportunity is available. Uh, we also do have in our healthcare center, uh, we have some opportunities. So those who maybe have some professional skills like physiotherapist or chiropractor or dentist, those are some of the areas that we're looking for. Uh, and just because they're specialized doesn't mean you need to be full time. Uh, you can do as little as four hours a week to volunteer with us, uh, depending on the role. So uh, this is an opportunity uh, for people to see where they can fit in, really. Sure. I, I think some of our clinicians even serve once a month, not uh, some of them once yeah. a week and some of them once a month. Uh, one thing I didn't hear you mention was our, our secondhand store, because I know that we also yes. help. We have some folks that come and help sort those donations there as well. That's something that my own daughter got excited about was to try to yeah. um, she loves upcycling and vintage and all that kind of stuff. So it was really exciting for her to find that spot to um, connect um, with the work of the city and to see it as something where she is giving back to someone else, even though um, she didn't feel like she had any money she could give or anything like that because she's still um, she's still quite young. Absolutely. So there really is a place for everybody, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm grateful. How, like you've shared with us some really practical ways that uh, people can support the changing of lives by volunteer. And that, um, that's really myth busting, right? Because I think there can have that feeling that like, what can I do? Um, and even if it's not volunteering with us, which we've given lots of examples are, that Give6 does give some tools for to think creatively and innovatively about our own spheres of how we can help in our own neighborhood. So I'd like to, because uh, we're kind of wrapping up in terms of time, I want to bring Esther back onto the screen as well so the three of us could be there because I want to turn to some of the questions that uh, we've been receiving there in the Q&A. Thank you. Welcome back, Esther. Um, all right, let me take a look here. I think I've got yeah, I've got two here that I want to start with. So um, the first question is, um, what should I do if someone asks me for money as I walk by them on the street? Uh, Esther, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so first thing is to acknowledge the person and greet them. Just, you know, start a brief conversation. Um, it really depends on the flow of it as well. But I've also had situations where people will come up to me. And um, if we were close to any YSM centers, we would walk there together so that they could get some food or use the services. Um, and if they want to go another time, they could. Um, otherwise, um, I could, I would give them my number um, or the, sorry, or the YSM's general number for the receptionist. We are a phone call away and so they can visit any time if they need uh, food containers or um, any other services. Yeah. I'm sort of looking at them, acknowledging them. And if you know something nearby, kind of connecting them or giving them a phone number um, or access to a phone. Sure. What about you, Jeff, what ideas would you have if somebody were to ask you what they might do if they pass someone on the street that's asking them for money? Yeah, uh, I agree with Esther completely. I think it's just acknowledging them, uh, making sure that you're responding to them as another human uh, and uh, inviting them to see what other supports might be available uh, for them. Uh, and for, for the person who's there in that moment, right, that is one of your opportunities to give six. That's a give six opportunity for you to see what can I do? Uh, and sometimes you might say, oh, I just bought lunch or, you know, would you like this lunch, right? That could be one of your six actions or can I buy you a lunch today um, yeah. from wherever you'd like? So. Right. I, I've actually heard some people say they carry um, 
uh, gift cards to whatever the locust fast food chain is like Timmy's or something like that. And they just have those in their pocket to offer when somebody asks, because they may not have may not have time and they're commuting, right? To like, oh, I got to stop and buy a meal and I'm not gonna be able to make it home in time, but they may just keep that in their pocket as that capacity to offer food, but in a kind of different format. So lots of ideas out there. And so probably definitely check out Give Six to see if there's more um, ideas. Cause I think this is something that if you live in Toronto is something that all of us face. Um, as we walk around the streets, we bump into people and people are asking us um, and we can see uh, their need and it tugs at our heart and we want to do the right thing um, and want to respond in a way that is life-giving and that would move to changing lives. The, the second question that I have here is, um, you know, more of our context right now, which is obviously COVID. Um, how has COVID and the rising costs um, impacted uh, the people we work with, their capacity to rise out of poverty? So I think there you could sort of make it to your program, um, Esther, or your area, Jeff, but how have you seen the impact of COVID on the work you do and the people, more importantly, that we work with here at YSM? Um, for us uh, in the employment department, we've seen two biggest ways, um, the increase of mental health challenges and um, the closing down of businesses in Toronto, meaning there, it was really hard for businesses and, and work. Um, and so when we were able, our program was able to support them with the mental health. So a lot of um, our participants, they were super anxious about even going outside, just stepping outside. Uh, they only wanted to um, to stay home and not want to commute anywhere. And even when we had our virtual uh, workshops online, uh, they didn't feel comfortable turning on their video. You know, they're mute. They were always muted. And slowly, because of the the relationship building, and they gained gained more confidence and they were more comfortable, they were able to start talking in, in the workshop, start engaging, and they would turn on their videos and eventually they would meet uh, the workers, the staff here one-on-one uh, to receive their tokens or a Presto card uh, to, to prep for the work. And so it was really nice to see um, them in person. Um, so yeah, in a lot of those ways, uh, not only were their mental health stabilized but they're also able they're able to find work as well. So Esther if I'm hearing what you're saying COVID impacted our capacity to meet with people obviously so we had to shift that virtual and it impacted our participants the people whom we serve by really increasing their anxiety and their stress and I think that's been for everybody right and as all the rules have changed over time I know one of the things I've noticed is that it's hard sometimes even for people to keep up with the changes that are coming. Um, have you had any, um, have you noticed any change in those anxiety levels or have you had conversations with some of the folks you work with around kind of the opening up and what that might mean for them? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it was a really big deal for them to even turn on their videos and start engaging. Um, because if you think about it, uh, pre-COVID, you would all meet in person have the introduction, but I actually met a lot of um, our community members online. And that's, it's a different feel, you know, it's still very um, warm and welcoming, and we still can build that relationship, but it was just different. And so when we're able to meet in person, the energy is different, right? Like, uh, the level of walls also, um, they can be um, a little bit less guarded. Um, it was just really great. Yeah, um, we're able to use both platforms like virtually and meet in person and then help prep them for employment. Yeah, we certainly haven't lost the virtual, right? It's now become embedded as part, like we're trying to take the best of what happened in COVID and sort of carry it forward. But I, I do know the difference, like from shoulders up, a person is very different than when you meet them in person. And there's just a deeper capacity to connect when you are uh, sitting in the same room with someone, even masks on that just, it just has that, um, just has that room to really develop that rapport and trust in a way that the virtual can can sometimes create a barrier. Not always, because our mm -hmm. uh, mental health staff are very good at using the virtual platform, but um, we do go to a different level in person. Exactly. Jeff, what about you? What about COVID and volunteers? How has it impacted uh, 
uh, your perspective and the work that you do and, and the volunteers and their capacity to serve with us. Yeah, so even uh, from the beginning of COVID, um, you know, our volunteer numbers plunged dramatically because we couldn't do anything. Uh, and uh, we then had volunteers reaching out and saying, but I want to get involved, what can I do? Uh, and so we saw volunteers that came in and supported us as soon as we could let them come in. Uh, and then as we kind of built up these opportunities, uh, we saw more um, organizations and more donors coming in as well to support us during COVID. And what was neat is for volunteers who are especially on the ground, they got to see this firsthand, the generosity of the donors uh, to support what was a rising need, for instance, in our food bank, in our kitchen, and the donors, uh, the, the donors brought that and the volunteers then said, how can I support this to make sure that this gets out to the community members? So it was a really great opportunity to see how those two came together in a very a harsh time for us as a society. Um, and volunteers have continued to adapt to all the changes that we've had um, and be there in person to be that support person and just say, you are seen and you are loved and you're a beloved part of our, our community. Well, that, that's a, a beautiful way to end. You are seen and you are loved and you are part of our community. Um, that, that, who doesn't wanna hear that every day? Um, and who doesn't need to uh, recognize that um, and offer that to others every day? Um, it looks like we do have a few more questions. Um, as we heard at the beginning though, we're gonna make sure we follow up on all of them in an email. So I encourage those of you who are watching, uh, you know, feel free to type them in the Q&A there. Uh, we're gonna note them, we're gonna respond to you if you've written something there. Um, and do look for our next Poverty Mythbusters uh, webinar. It's gonna take that step from the individual, which is what we were focusing on today, the individual uh, changing lives to the collective. At our next webinar in the series, uh, we're gonna be looking at the role of community development in the alleviation of poverty with a special focus on the area where four of YSM's buildings are located, the Regent Park area. So take a look for that coming. Thank you for your participation today. And if you wanna learn more, uh, as Jeff was talking about, of how you can connect with us, uh, please do check out ysm.ca slash give six. Thank you. <laughs>